Okay. So welcome to this um, web seminar. I guess it's not a web seminar. The CE on addressing the problem of dairy calf gastrointestinal disease through enhanced diagnostics, novel therapeutics, and practical education. That's a long way of saying that we recently completed a study um, this past summer of 2019 looking into gastrointestinal disease in calves as part of a larger USDA project that um, we had funded along with a, a couple other funding sources that I'll mention in a moment. But first, before I even get into this project, I just wanted to say that this project was totally dependent on graduate students and postdoc input, um, primarily of which was driven by Giovanna Slanzone, who is the PhD student uh, overseeing this project and taking it on as her own. But we also had input and help from a uh, vet student, Lisa Shaw, and then um, a couple of postdocs, Dr. Leticia Tomasini, who is working on a pathology residency in Italy, did her PhD here at WSU with us previously, and Dr. Chloe stinkamp strum who is actually just wrapping up vet school, but did her PhD at Colorado State prior to um, finishing her vet school degree as well. So I just wanted to point out that this work would not have done, been done or could not have been done without their help. So again, on the acknowledgement side, this was funded through a USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture AFRI competitive grant, um, and then also has some, some backing through USDA funding through WSU, as well as internal funding through the College of Veterinary Medicine, um, through the Caldwell endowment, endowment here at WSU, and then some funding as well through American Jersey Cattle Association. So we were lucky enough to have multiple layers of funding to help out with this project, um, and ultimately help drive us uh, forward on this. Okay, so basically this is, um, this, the, this discussion today and this presentation is building off of not only the work that we did this summer, but then some ongoing extension work that we've been doing since this summer, trying to package up some of the preliminary data. And while this does not have the complete data from the summer's project, I think that it sets the stage really nicely for um, some of the additional work that, that we're, or some of the additional analyses that we're currently working on that will hopefully be the topic of a future discussion. So for the purpose of the, this morning, what we're going to talk about is the baseline work that we did on this project, which was focused on on-farm calf postmortem evaluations as part of practical health assessments, and then the, um, the development of the progression of the calf GI microbiota using some pretty specific diagnostics focused on the microbiome, and then some bacterial work looking into specific bacteria like bifidobacteria, and then overlying all that with things like breed differences um, in terms of Jersey and Holstein outcomes. So the ultimate goal was to focus on um, how, how can we do a better job of diagnosing GI disease, and then ultimately how does GI disease uh, impact these calves. Okay, so I thought, and I've been starting with this, uh, with this discussion in some of our extension work, that it's worth mentioning some of the motivations of how we got to where we got. Basically, long story short, this project really started on the back of some traveling that I've, that I've done in the past, where I ultimately found that GI disease was one of the possible repercussions of trying anything and everything off the street and ultimately getting food and eating things that I probably should not have or that my GI system just was not ready to accept. And so on the back of that and having some pretty severe consequences with GI disturbances, it made me think that one of the things that we really have to consider when we're talking about calf GI disease is how do they ultimately recover from the process, not just how do we treat the process. And that really came about from the fact that um, on a, a trip that I had to Mexico, coming back from having worked in Australia for a while, my GI upset was so severe that when I ultimately ended up in Colorado doing um, some work at Colorado State University and their dairy ambulatory, I found that my GI was not right for about three months post return from Mexico. And so it got me thinking about how long it really takes calves to recover from similar insults to their GI system. Admittedly, I think that um, we all recognize that in general, neonates respond certainly differently than an adult and have the capacity to regenerate um, GI tissue, et cetera, much more rapidly, but nonetheless, it really did drive home the fact that it's not just treating it in real time, but also looking at the repercussions downstream. So that, that was sort of the underlying motivation of this larger project, but more specifically, 
we got interested in this area based on the fact that we know, and there's published data to support, that gastrointestinal disease is the most common illness resulting in antimicrobial mic use in pre-weaned dairy calves. And so obviously we're all tuned into the fact that finding alternatives to antibiotics and then looking for ways to prevent um, the need for those antibiotics uh, gets you know, to the heart of antimicrobial stewardship. So really at the sort of fundamental level of this project, um, we're looking at how do we understand the diversity of underlying disease processes better so that we can do a better job of not only preventing but ultimately treating those. So what I failed to mention coming into this presentation is that the larger scope uh, perspective of this, of this uh, project is focusing on whether or not we could develop a fecal microbial or microbiota transplant as an alternative to standard therapies. So I'll speak about that towards the end of this presentation, um, and it's the, it's the underlying piece of the puzzle that we'll be focusing on for future presentations. But just know that moving forward, this was ultimately focusing on trying to develop a fecal microbial transplant or microbiota transplant. Okay, so the take home for this whole project, um, but I, what I like to start with is that we're really focused on the fact that case definitions and then uh, microbiota and pathology as part of those case definitions matter. And I think that there's a sort of three take homes moving forward through this, through this um, presentation. One, doing necropsies will help define case definitions, and doing necropsies ultimately gives insight into things that we miss when we start looking at outcomes just purely clinically, as opposed to having the opportunity to look at them pathologically. Two, it's clear that we all, as veterinarians, have the option to be more focused as researchers than, than um, just clinicians. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes we overlook, is the fact that we have the capacity um, and you know the fundamental training to look at problems through the researcher's eye as opposed to just dealing with them clinically. And you know they're, they're tied together closely, but it's worth acknowledging the fact that we can address these problems that come up through that researcher's lens. And then three, uh, it's really worth thinking about the fact that there are, are these levels of case definitions, which things like pathology help define, but ultimately um, nuanced perspectives and training and you know, general education of the people who are helping with the clinical assessments can help with, uh, with defining as well. And so one of the things that we'll talk about um, a little bit later in this presentation relative to the project at hand is the fact that something as simple as diarrhea, which has been historically used for defining um, a specific case, actually is really more of a symptom. It's not really a disease in and of itself. And I think once we start thinking about the nuances of diseases, such as the fact that diarrhea is a symptom and not a disease, it really helps us break down how to deal with those animals. Um, again, not just on, on a treatment level, but also on a preventative level. So those three take homes are kind of driving moving forward. So more specifically in terms of motivation, we did a study a couple summers ago looking at different mortality phenotypes through postmortem analysis. And during that project, we found a very specific lesion that stood out in a number of calves. Uh, and it was, it's this necrotizing enterocolitis, which um, in most cases actually targets the cecum, so a necrotizing tiflitis. And based on the back of that study, it raised a lot of questions about whether or not there are uh, underlying issues like antimicrobial use or um, you know, breed differences or other issues to, uh, related to nutrition that are driving that specific outcome, which ultimately then led to the larger question of, uh, you know, are there alternatives to antimicrobials and to some of the treatment therapies that we've been using? So looking into the human literature, as you can see here, this uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is thought to develop following a combination of prematurity, formula feeding, adverse microbial colonization, um, and then ultimately seems to align with the deficiency of commensal bacteria, which may lead to a further breakdown of host defenses. So with those things in mind, it started really making us question the epidemiology of this very specific lesion that we were seeing in our, our postmortem analysis. And then ultimately, looking a little further into the human literature, it looks as if antimicrobials may help with the progression of the disease and that it, it has antimicrobials or antibiotics have the potential to induce changes or dysbiosis of the intestinal microbiome as well. Microbiome as well. So with all of those underlying epidemiologic risk factors in mind, we wanted to chase out that specific lesion 
again and do some further work looking into what might be underlying that particular pathology as part of the larger landscape of GI disease in general. So that was sort of a very specific motivation for doing some additional work on the pathology side that helped inform some of the work we we're doing on the microbiota side. Okay, so I thought that I'd start by just walking through what we found then focusing on that lesion in our necropsy portion of the study, which again was helping form the overall perspective of the GI disease and the income or the outcomes from the GI disease. Keep in mind again that what I'm talking about here is setting the stage for the, the future exploration of the fecal micro, microbiota therapy. And so initially what we were trying to do is at the front end of this project was to describe GI disease and the severities or, or the nuances therein so that we could actually have groupings of not just the GI disease, but also who, who can we classify as healthy so that we could use those healthy cows for the fecal microbial microbiota therapy transplant product. So the necropsy study itself brings out a couple different things that I think are worth mentioning, um, just in terms of practicalities. And when we've done this as part of a CE program, we hand out this handout, which is just a checklist for doing the necropsies on farm. And we kind of walk through some of the procedural aspects of, of how we did the necropsies on the farm and, and how we think that, um, you know, by, by putting things in place and doing some specific things like using uh, checklists like this, you can actually really help facilitate not just um, getting necropsies done in general, but also standardizing your outcomes. And then ultimately getting other people involved so that the veterinarian doesn't have to be the only one doing the project. And one of the things that we found across both summers worth of work is that Typically, if you get people involved who don't have much training doing necropsies and you use a checklist like this, you can very quickly get people up to speed with getting the samples that are required. It takes a little bit longer to start getting more uh, information relative to what they're seeing in terms of abnormal or normal, but very quickly, actually, within a couple weeks, you tend to see a transition from notes taken like this to notes that start looking a little bit more like this. And so what we've found, and, and we've done this a couple different times in a couple different settings, is that regardless of who you have helping, undergraduate students, farm workers, um, veterinary students, etc., it does not take long for people to start really making clean um, notes relative to what looks different um, relative to what they have now recognized as normal. And I think that that's a really sort of fundamental take home from these projects is that we can get involved in the calves, we can get involved doing these necropsies without necessarily having to have our hands in every case. Um, one of the other little tricks of the trade that I think a number of people are using and have certainly been pushed through um, certain online, online formats, but also we found to work within our field studies is getting uh, apps in, like WhatsApp in, in, involved in the process so that pictures can be taken and shared to the group who are overseeing these outcomes so that additional insight and um, clarity can be applied to the specific cases that you're looking at. So I think that's a really int interesting and important thing. And then ultimately, as part of the larger project that we're working on, we're putting together videos and we'll ultimately have a picture bank as well, a photo bank of pathology versus normal to kind of help clarify some of these issues that do come up relative to is this normal? Is this not normal? How do I do this? How do I sample, et cetera? So this QR code, um, We'll take you to a, a YouTube channel that we've created that walks through some of the basic videos for just standard sampling. And this summer, we actually will have Lisa Shaw, who I mentioned earlier in, in this presentation, working on collating um, literally thousands of photos that we took over the last summer, as well as videos, to put them together and, and create, a, hopefully, a nice clean uh, summary of here's how you can do necropsies, here's how you can uh, discriminate between pathology and, and normal with the backing of uh, quite a large number of, of Washington Animal Diagnostic Disease Lab samples that we submitted to validate uh, the findings that we had and the pathology that we we're seeing grossly. So that is a work in progress and that will certainly be something that we'll be advertising later on at the end of the summer after we have this wrapped up. Okay, just to sort of wrap up this piece on the necrotizing tephlitis, while we don't actually have a clear understanding of what's causing it, I, I did want to throw up this slide because it's interesting that what we're finding at a histopathologic level are thrombi and, and necrosis at the level of the mucosa that lends itself to some questions regarding cause and effect and whether or not 
the necrosis is actually leading to the thrombi or whether or not we're ending, we're actually getting an inflammatory process in thrombi prior to the necrosis. And so we're, we're working through some of that with an eye toward trying to figure out if there are specific underlying factors that we can tie back to other epidemiologic risk, risks. Um, just as sort of background, we did find in our study that rotavirus was, pos was present in all of the animals that have this lesion and coronavirus and cryptosporidium were just occasionally detected. That said, rotavirus is also present um, frequently in animals without this lesion, so it's not as if we can tie it specifically to the lesion itself. Um, we looked for salmonella, we looked for clostridium difficile. Difficile was really never present. Salmonella was an occasionally detected, certainly not at a level that suggested causality. And then general bacteri bacteriology um, culture really didn't show us anything specific. We had some potentially path pathogenic bacteria and uh, a mix of environmental and opportun opportunistic commensals. So no particular agent actually seems, seems to be the single cause of the mortality. So at the moment, Leticia is working on this as part of her studies in, the, in pathology in Perugia in Italy to try to come to some better understanding as far as what might have been some of the underlying uh, factors that, that ultimately su supported this lesion. And we're focusing on nutrition and breed differences and some other aspects. But the bottom line is we're pretty comfortable that whatever is causing it ultimately is leading to a dysbiosis which is sort of helping perpetuate the problem, whether or not it's through some immunologic changes or, or bacteriologic toxin, toxin level changes are unknown. <clears throat> so we will follow up with this and hopefully we'll have a little better understanding of this moving forward. But at, at the moment, what this really does then is supports the fact that whether or not we're focusing on that specific lesion or GI disease in general, this, this concept of dysbiosis seems to be one of the underlying factors that's worth chasing up. And so that lends itself then to this phase one of the field trial that we were doing to try to set the stage for who has GI disease and who doesn't. How do we actually call an animal, quote unquote, healthy so that we could use that animal's feces as part of a fecal microbiota therapeutic product? So what I'm going to walk through in the next number of the slides are, are the setup and then the results from this phase one of the field trial. And like I said, we'll eventually be able to circle back and have another one of these um, CE events relative to the FMT outcomes. But at the moment, I just want to talk about some of, some of the findings relative to the healthy versus disease. So just to set the stage, we had 360 calves that were enrolled in this project that we pursued looking for the disease versus healthy. We did repeat fecal collections from 5 to 24 days of age. And we did blood collections as well to do some work on um, inflammatory indicators as well as trying to set the stage for, um, oh, sorry, inflammatory indicators in the blood, but then using some of the fecal collections, not just for the microbiota, but also to look at some gene expression and epithelial cells as well that we're currently working on as well. But unfortunately, I don't have results from yet. Then we did twice daily evaluations, assessing health status and disease severity, and clinical signs, behavior, milk intake, and treatments became part of that. And like I said earlier, I think it's really important to underscore the fact that diarrhea was recognized as a symptom and not a disease. And this has come up um, in numerous discussions as we've done some of the CE events around this project, in that it, it's clear that workers, veterinarians, all of us struggle with actually doing a clean diagnosis of diarrhea as a disease in and of itself. One of the things that we recognized really quickly in this project was that under the circumstances, it was virtually impossible to tell whether or not the feces that we were looking at on the ground was new or old. And in many cases, what was on the ground was um, you know, solid that was visible. And uh, once we actually sampled the calf and worked with the calf individually that day, we found that that calf's feces looked different from what we were seeing on the ground. So we ultimately had to come to the conclusion that for our study to incorporate disease in, or sorry, diarrhea into the clinical assessment, we could really only do it at the time of sampling when we were actively collecting the feces itself. And I think that's a really important take home. And it gets at the heart of the fact that um, probably the, the best thing that you can do and that we found that we could do in terms of clinical assessments was to look at the calf from the behavioral perspective. So are they, is their appetite normal? Are they bouncing around? Are they acting happy? Or happy being the wrong word. Are they acting active? Are they ultimately feeling good as far as you can tell clinically? 
And then we ultimately just broke down these animals into bright or depressed based on that behavior and appetite. With diarrhea, like I said, just a symptom um, only associated at the time of sampling. So using that then at the time of sampling, we were able to say, okay, this calf on this day, bright or depressed, either does or does not have diarrhea. And then we followed these calves, looked at these calves um, in terms of what we had from previous samples. And we were able to classify calves as consistently healthy over a 28-day period or having had evidence of disease uh, relative to that diarrhea at the time of sampling relative then again to the behavior and appetite. So we had these clinical assessments that we tied back to the sampling day. Okay, so from that, and using those discriminating clinical assessments and sampling assessments, we had 73 fecal samples from healthy calves, and then we had 30 samples from calves at the onset of diarrhea and prior to treatment. And I want to hit that home that these calves that we, the 30 calves that we had samples from at the onset of diarrhea means that like I said, we recognized diarrhea on the day of sampling. They had loose feces using the fecal scoring chart, and they had not been treated yet for any disease prior to that. So using that discrimination, we had 12 calves that were otherwise bright, good appetite, looked normal, quote unquote, and then we had 18 calves that were sick. So relatively small numbers, um, of which we've added more on the second half of the study that we're currently working through the data tied to the FMT administration. But this is what we use to help set the stage for how do we actually call a calf healthy versus diseased, and then within the diseased, how can we discriminate? So across these samples, we were able to represent different breeds and ages from 5 to 24 days. Uh, we, sent, we screened for salmonella, and then we ultimately had bifidobacterium quantification via qPCR to go along with 16S RNA sequence analysis to get at the fecal microbiome itself. Okay, just real briefly, we had in our population, 18% of Holsteins with GI disease incidence. Jersey had 60% with GI disease. Jersey crosses had 25%, and beef crosses were affected 12% of the time with GI disease incidence, which I don't think anybody would find particularly surprising in terms of that breakdown across the different breeds. Okay, so I'm going to delve into some diversity measures here, which, to be honest, we're dumbing down at this stage in the game just to keep it simple. And I, I think anybody who's done any work with microbiomes and specifically with um, trying to quantify and, and speak to the various aspects of those microbiomes, such as using diversity, understands that these measures can be complicated and complex and difficult to explain. So I don't understand them that well, so I like to keep it as simple as possible. Speaking to the Shannon diversity, what we're focused on here is the number of microbial species in the healthy calves. So we're trying to set the stage here for what we found in terms of discriminating between healthy versus disease. And what you see here is that the number of microbial species in those fecal samples progressed and increased um, as we moved into that third and fourth week, which is what we expected and that's what the literature would support. So not an unexpected finding, but nice to have validation within our population that the healthy calves showed what we, what we would expect in terms of a normal progression of diversity and a normal change in terms of the number of microbial species. It's worth noting, however, that the species count using this diversity measure fails to capture the relatedness or the proportional distribution of those species. So this is just a, a simple measure looking at the number. Okay, then if we jump to this beta diversity and we look at it in terms of the similarity of species within those healthy calves, what we find is that in these samples from one week to four weeks, we don't really see anything that stands out in terms of a cluster that would suggest some sort of specific grouping that would indicate that there are populations or, or types of species in any of these given weeks. And again, I think that this is not unexpected. This is sort of what we would expect to see. The data um, that we've seen recently coming out of other work being done across different populations would suggest that as these animals get older and certainly move to adulthood, you'll see a, a big switch in terms of what species are there and the clusters start looking quite clean. But in this sort of tight window of time up to four weeks of age, we're not seeing a big difference in those species. Okay, then we just wanted to look at these by breed in these healthy calves just to see if there were anything, uh, any, if there was anything that sort of stood out that could maybe help explain some of the outcome differences we saw uh, just 
you know, in terms of how many calves had diarrhea and then some of the outcome measures that I'll talk about in a minute relative to breeds. We wanted to see if there were any differences in the healthy calves of different breeds to see if that sort of set the stage. And one of the things you'll see here is we had more Holstein calves. So it starts looking a little bit clustered just based on the overall numbers of samples that we had. But I think if you kind of look across those dots of beef cross, Holstein, Jersey, and Jersey cross, there's really nothing that jumps out at us that would suggest that there are discrete populations of the types of species in these healthy calves by breed. So again, nothing there that would suggest that um, one or another breed would be predisposed to a certain outcome based on a population in the healthy calves themselves. Okay, so then to get it at the heart of the matter relative to the disease state itself, we, start, we just broke it down very simply in terms of um, calves that were classified as healthy. We, we had no treatments. We'd seen no evidence of disease. They were bright the whole time. There was no diarrhea at the time of sampling. Relative to calves that had diarrhea at the sampling but were otherwise bright, so that's the BS calves, the bright sick calves, relative to those calves that had diarrhea and were depressed sick. The DS calves. And as you can see, if we just look at the number of microbial species again using this Shannon diversity index, we can see that the numbers really do start to drop off as we move forward in, an, um, in the disease complexity. And so the animals that are more severely affected, those depressed sick calves, show us a, a, a smaller number of microbial species. <clears throat> And then that really plays out nicely as we look at, again, this beta diversity in terms of what those species are, the similarity of the species, in that the healthy calves really do start to look like a different cluster and a separate cluster from the bright sick and the depressed sick calves. What we don't see here in this relatively simple assessment of these calves' um, beta diversity is, is no real obvious discrimination between the bright sick and the depressed sick. So those populations and similarity species therein don't look grossly to be different but we are seeing a difference there that sort of stands out um, relative to the healthy calves. So not unexpected, but certainly worth noting and kind of helps set the stage for some of the findings that we'll talk about um, in a minute relative to specific bacterial populations. Okay, so one other way of looking at this then is looking at these breed differences relative to the healthy, bright, and depressed sick calves. And so we we broke this down by Holstein, Jersey, and Jersey Cross by their health status. And I think the, th the thing to notice here, which is a little bit tricky when you first look at it, but if you look across here at the Holstein calves, and you see in the healthy population that this index says that they're at about a three. So, you know, this is a, a pretty basic level way of looking at this, but nonetheless, at, a, at about a three in the healthy Holsteins, and then at about a 3.5 in the bright sick, and then at about a 3.5 in the Holstein, in the Holstein and the depressed sick. Not huge numbers, obviously, to support these findings, and we're accumulating more data, or we're looking, we're analyzing more data right now to, to see if we can support this. But what this seems to indicate is that in terms of the Shannon diversity, which again is talking about the number of species, we're not really seeing a big difference, and if anything, a small uptick from the healthy to the bright the depressed Holstein calves. On the other hand, if you look at these Jersey calves, we started a fairly high index at 3.5, and then as we move to the bright sick, we end up at a little bit under 3.5, and then by the time we get down to this depressed sick, that count has really dropped off down to about a 2.75. Again, not huge numbers, and this is preliminary data, but it starts to suggest that these Jerseys are, are responding to um, the disease processes differently which ultimately might be impacting some of the findings that we're seeing, um, you know, relative to specific things like that necrotizing enterocolitis, which we found more frequently in jerseys as well. Okay, if we then take it a little bit further and we look at what are the similarities of the species by disease state and breed, and I kicked out some of them that we didn't have um, enough numbers to really speak to. So some of the Jersey cross data was uh, numerically I would argue irrelevant with one or one or two calves at this stage. But if we focus on the bright sick Holsteins and the bright sick jerseys, which are these red and blue, and then we look at the depressed sick Holsteins and the depressed sick jerseys, which are the green and purples, they really still align pretty tightly as opposed to the healthy Holsteins and the healthy jerseys. So again, a nice tight discrimination at this level between healthy and sick, but not a big difference in terms of the level of sick, so depressed sick versus bright sick, and not big differences or noticeable differences, I should say, 
relative to Holstein versus Jersey. So kind of interesting findings at that level as well. Okay, so now let's move to a cladogram, which starts to actually break this down in terms of what are those populations that we're talking about between the sick calves and the healthy calves. And the way to look at this, this chart is basically to look for the larger circles. That's the most simplistic aspect of this chart. So larger circles means that relative to the other animals, so healthy versus disease, these particular types of bacteria, phyla, class families, um, were standing out. And what you'll see here, and we'll come back to some of this, is that there are fairly discrete populations or types of bacteria like the bifidobacteria that stand out in the healthy calves versus uh, Bacillaceae, Listeriaceae, Clostridiaceae, and even Lactobacillaceae that, assuming I'm stating those correctly, that stand out in these, uh, in these diseased calves. So, that sort of sets the stage then for the types of these bacteria that are standing out in these different states of animals, in these different health classes. Taking that one step further then, we can look at it in terms of the bright sick versus the depressed sick versus the healthy as well. And what you'll see here if you compare back to the other slide is that actually there's really no difference between the bright sick and depressed sick. Um, and then again, the healthy basically has the same in terms of relative assessment against those bright sick and depressed sick. So bifido again, bacteria, Bacterioidaceae um, versus the Lactobacillus, Streps, Clostridia, um, Enterobacteriaceae, which we're seeing in the depressed sick or the bright sick calves. So, in other words, what this is showing us in sort of a convoluted way is that the bright sick and depressed sick pretty much look like the diseased. The, there really is no discrimination, which again, coming back here is not surprising if we go back to the beta diversity plot, which would suggest that the similarity of species is basically the same in those bright sick versus depressed sick calves. But it's different relative to the, the healthy calves, as you would expect, and there are specific types of bacteria that are standing out. So one of our interests um, is bifidobacteria, and it turns out that when you start breaking this down by the individual level, we find that, yep, as expected, healthy calves really do have a difference in terms of the relative abundance, which is over here on the y-axis. Um, the healthy calves have a, a significant difference, a large difference in terms of the relative abundance of bifidobacteria relative to the bright sick and depressed sick calves, which we, we had indicated in the previous cladogram, but stands out a little bit more starkly here. And then interesting, if you look at a couple different um, levels, you see that Lactobacillus and E. coli are both um, quite um, substantially higher in terms of relative abundance in these bright sick, depressed sick animals versus the healthy calves as well. And of course, for those of you who've been paying attention to what goes into probiotics or prebiotics and the fact that Lactobacillus is spoken of as <clears throat> one of the bacteria that might be part of a healthy gut system, this raises the question of, um, of course of, of cause and effect. And is this a response? To the disease and we're seeing this in animals as sort of a response to the fact that they have GI disease or is for some reason this something related to um, actually the effects of the disease themselves and so you know have we actually uh, denuded in other words the other bacteria and left the lactobacillus or are we seeing the lactobacillus coming back and forth as response to the disease itself so work to be done in terms of cause and effect certainly but interesting in terms of what this suggest uh, in terms of the, the changing dynamic within that dysbiotic population. So one of our interests is bifidobacteria. Um, we have been focused on that within um, at WSU for a while and focused on it across different studies. And you know it, it's it's an interesting bacteria in that various studies in the in the human side of things have demonstrated that some members of the bifidobacterial community can cooperate in order to degrade large and complex polysaccharides into more simple sugars, which are then in turn available to other members of the gut microbiota. So in other words, it sort of becomes a predominant species that sets up other species. Uh, such that bifidobacteria have been found to shape the microbiome in mice, uh, either through direct action or by cross-feeding activities. And so it becomes sort of a, a apex species that, that people have focused on in terms of setting the stage or are providing an indication of gut health. And we just wanted to throw up these graphs to point to the fact that if you look at this analytically, we actually do see some differences that stand out statistically. This is showing us the difference between healthy in green and diseased in pink 
by week of age, so within the first week versus the second week, and you'll see that those calves that were healthy had a, a higher count of the bifidobacteria. And then this is just looking across different disease types, so the bright sick in red, the depressed sick in green, and the healthy in blue across all weeks, so you know accumulated data. And again, it, it suggests that the bifidobacteria in the healthy calves are at a higher level. So supports statistically um, what we were seeing previously in the cladograms as well as the uh, beta diversity. And not unexpected given the fact that, that bifidobacteria have been singled out as one of the populations that support a healthy gut. Okay, so this is something that we're just working on now, actually trying to ferret out some of the treatments. So we actually had some calves that we were able to follow um, as we moved into the fecal microbiota therapeutic project that were treated with other things. So prior to getting into the FMT analysis, we were able to sort of dig into some calves that were treated with other things like prebiotics, anti-inflammatories, um, and KL and pectin with or without antibiotics. And then specifically with just a single antibiotic versus a mix of antibiotics, which includes sulfas, ceftifir, and then in calves that also manifest respiratory disease, um, the use of interfloxacin. Uh, versus animals that were not treated with anything. So no prebiotic, no anti-inflammatories, and no antibiotics. And so uh, we don't have huge numbers on this yet, and we're just starting to, to really get into the data, and then ultimately we'll overlay this with some of the FMT data that, we, that we're working on. I thought that I'd give you a bit of a snapshot in terms of what we we're seeing relative to these outcomes. So this gets a little complex and a little bit complicated, but let me walk through what we're seeing here. So we have this category one, no antimicrobials, but had um, the mix of prebiotics and anti-inflammatories with, with or without some KL and pectin. And I believe one of these calves in this class one that were bright sick actually did not get a prebiotic. It just ended up with some anti-inflammatories, but ended up in this group. So we have this, looking here on the slide, we have category one BS, so bright sick calves, no antimicrobials, but prebiotics or anti-inflammatories. And we had healthy calves that from our perspective uh, and our clinical assessments, we never saw anything that was, su that was suggestive of disease that also received these various treatments. Then we have this category two, which re received similar prebiotics and anti-inflammatories, but also got um, antimicrobials. And they could have gotten um, either solo uh, septifer sulfur, or um, they could have got in combination treatments with uh, with antimicrobials depending on how the progression of the disease went down. No more than two antimicrobials within the time frame that we assessed them. And ultimately then following these samples um, out to one to nine days uh, after having been treated, what, they, what the fecal sample would tell us. And so in this case, we've got these animals that were bright sick with one depressed sick that fell into this group and then healthy. And then we've got this category three, which received only Ceftifir with anti-inflammatories, whether bright, sick, or healthy. And then we had a category four, which was a no treatment group. So again, a little bit complex and a lot of, a lot of colors there, but I think there's just a couple major take homes here. One, what we see here is that there's an indication, small numbers, some preliminary data, nonetheless, an indication that would suggest that the BS calves, these bright, sick calves treated with antimicrobials appeared to demonstrate less diversity than BS calves with antibi antibiotics. So these are the BS calves with antimicrobials here and here. And if we compare those against these BS calves that did not receive antimicrobials or any other treatment or did receive some other treatment like a probiotic but no antimicrobials, it starts to look like we may be actually affecting the, the microbiota and reducing that alpha diversity, the number of microbial species. And then I think the second take home that kind of jumps out here is that the healthy calves with a mix of antibiotics and prebiotics were similar to the BS calves with, with antibiotics. So what we have here is healthy calves, no treatment, you know, a large window, and that's we had bigger numbers, so we had more variation here. But if you compare those against these healthy calves that um, received a mix of antibiotics, potentially based on um, on-farm personnel, assessments of, of health and, and need and, and comparing that against us and our assessment, we saw no, um, no standout health issues. You start to see maybe some indication that 
treating these calves actually may lead to a little bit of a reduction in those numbers as well. Difficult to say at this stage though, because we don't have huge numbers. And I think that probably the larger take home at this stage in the game would be that um, these BS calves that were treated with antimicrobials appear to have a reduction in that overall alpha diversity. But let's look at this a different way that might actually sort of clarify some of the specifics and I think kind of help get at the heart of this. So we break this down again by that category one, two, three, four. And again, remind as a reminder, category one is, is um, broken into the prebiotics, anti-inflammatories, kale and pectin, but no antimicrobials. And we look at these category one bright sick calves. So they had diarrhea, but they were bright sick. It's kind of a spread. And actually when you look at these cladograms, it gives you an indication of what the bacteria are that are standing out relative to the other groups. And in this particular cladogram, the spread of red um, is actually not um, labeled. So nothing actually specifically stood out. There are no, no labels on this. And it was kind of this wide range of outcomes in terms of what those bacterial populations appear to be um, dominated by. But if we look at category two, and I should, I should mention here that on this cladogram, it just brings to the fore those uh, populations that are different relative to the other groups. So the category one healthy is not on this because there was nothing specific that rose to the fore. So category two, the bright sick with one DS, so one depressed sick calf, that received the prebiotics, anti-inflammatories with, a, with um, some antimicrobial, start showing these dominant um, species of Enterobacteriaceae and um, what this really sh suggests is that in these cases, we're seeing what we, what we tend to see as one of the populations that jumps out at us in the previous cladograms when we just look at healthy versus disease. So in other words, it appears that this treatment modality relative to our assessment of disease pre-treatment actually looks pretty similar. We start seeing these Enterobacteriaceae as one of the dominant species. Compare that to this group three, bright sick calves, again, diarrhea, but only receives antimicrobials and ceftiafir, did not receive um, any, uh, any other prebiotics or other antimicrobials. And this one's a little bit confusing, actually. So this, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how to say this, but Reconelliaceae is actually, um, uh, it's, it's, it's dissimilar to what we saw previously on other cladograms in that it's a member of the bacteroid, bacteroid, bacteroidetes, and that, that phylum um, is seemingly specialized to the digestive tract of a number of different animals, but more importantly, in, in our previous cladograms that we were looking at, we actually saw that phyla associated with the healthy group. So interesting, and I think if we just pop back here, and we look at that relative to this graph, it kind of is interesting to see that this one group but BS calves, sorry, right here, this BS calves um, that had only received the ceftifer and antimicrobials while having a number of species that would be, you know, similar to what we saw in these animals that were treated with other antimicrobials and pre-probiotic, or sorry, prebiotics, actually still ended up with uh, a dominant type of bacteria, family bacteria, that we actually saw with the, the healthy animals in our previous cladograms. So just kind of an interesting finding. Then if we look at this category three, which is the healthy, one, healthy calves that <clears throat> had received an anti-inflammatory anti and some safety for one, one to nine days prior to our um, fecal sample for various reasons, in many cases, just looking a little bit uh, ill, kind of looking septic as an as a, as a extreme neonate. What we see here is that in this particular case, this one dominant sort of purple realm uh, of Aristipolotrichia are a class of bacteria of the phylum Firmicutes, which is similar to what we saw in the cladograms previously uh, in which Firmicutes aligned with the healthy. So kind of interesting here in that while these animals were clinically um, healthy from our perspective during this trial, they had received some ceftifir, but their ultimate alignment in terms of bacterial population actually seems to sort of aligned with what we saw in previous healthy animals. So in this particular case, we're not really seeing much impact from the antimicrobial as far as we can tell. And then finally, this is probably the one that really stands out the most to me. This is the category four, bright sick calves that received no treatment. 
So these are the calves that, as far as we could tell, um, you know, had no depression. Their appetite was good. Our clinical assessments would suggest that this calf was cruising through. But at the time of sampling, it did have diarrhea. So that classic calf with scours that is otherwise um, unnoticed, unnotable actually had bifidobacteria as the standout population relative to these other classes. And I think that that's worth noting because I think that it kind of jumps out and suggests that when we talk about treating these animals and trying to figure out how to manage these different cases of, of what have historically been classified as diarrhea or scours, it really is worth overlying that specific symptom with the clinical signs. And I think that probably out of all of this, which is you know preliminary and small numbers and just trying to tell a little bit of a story, this is probably the thing that jumps out the most at me and really suggests that we, we really should focus on farms to try to do a better job of classifying animals across this gradient, recognizing the fact that those calves that are otherwise looking healthy really just need the fluids, should not be given antimicrobials. And I think that we all inherently know that, but it's nice to have some data to start to suggest that, in fact, if you can just manage those calves, give them their nutritional supplementation, give them their fluid supplementation as needed, keep them in that bright, bright sick category, you'll find that the bifidobacterium are actually uh, there and helping sort of respond to that process. It appears in this preliminary data. So that brings us to this sort of take home, which is that depending on the scenario, you know, we we classify these bacteria as good or bad. And really, depending on the network that we're talking about within the gut, depending on the um, overall ecology of that gut, any and all of these bacteria, bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, and E. coli have a role to play, and they're all part of a larger community. So getting to you know the discrimination of this is a good versus this is a bad really probably needs to be seen in light of what is the overall population and i think that's where everybody's headed with this micro these microbiome level studies is to get beyond just the individual bacteria assessments and try to look into those networks and try to really look into the communities and giovanna likes to use this story and i think it's worth worth using which is you know we we really should think about our healthy gut as being a jungle of of multiple species extremely verdant a huge community which is all tied together whereas once we rip through it with gi disease which is trust me what i felt like coming on the back end of my gi disease to having had tra traveler's diarrhea um is a completely denuded gut and if, if we only pay attention to trying to replace sort of the individual bacteria, if we're not paying attention to those communities, we run the risk of ending up with sort of a mon monoculture. And, you know, while we're trying to reset that gut, we probably really need to be paying attention to how do we get the larger population back? How do we standardize um, or, or get away from, I guess, standardizing just single bacteria populations and get into understanding that larger community? And how do we reset that? How do we help these calves get back to what... Uh, is normal as opposed to what would still be abnormal in terms of this monoculture style. So again, coming back full circle, um, this is really all about trying to think through what are the disruptions to the microbiota? How can we understand those disruptions? How can we classify these gradients of disease so that we have better case definitions on farm so that we can understand how to, again, prevent, but then as importantly, deal with those calves that have gone through this process and have ultimately denuded and um, destroyed their normal population such that they are going to take some time to rebound and get back to a normal ecology. And so we were at a conference of, uh, a couple months ago prior to this COVID outbreak, which was focused on microbiomes. And one of the things that was, was brought up was this idea of keystone species and the trophic levels that help regulate the ecosystem of food webs mm -hmm. in general. And this little cartoon is sort of speaking specifically to what's been seen in Yellowstone with the reintroduction of wolves as an apex predator that have helped sort of reset that overall ecological system. And people are starting to really pay attention more to this as an idea within our GI system as well. So what are the layers of bacteria? What are their trophic levels that ultimately impact the system as a whole, as opposed to just focusing on maybe resetting, um, you know, individuals and trying and just trying to look and, and focus at diagnostics relative to those individual species. But understanding that there are, in fact, layers to those species in terms of how they interact. So 
In the human realm, what we're seeing are, are things that are focusing on microhabitats and the food chains in the gut itself. And it's kind of interesting. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but it's interesting when you start thinking through the process of the GI system and where these different bacteria are and the role that they're playing. And as you start looking into that more specifically, you see that things like these primary degraders, the bifidobacterium, really help set the stage for um, producing intermediate products that are required for the secondary levels, those, those follow-on bacteria that are dependent upon this. And so you actually really do have sort of this food chain effect that I think that we need to recognize and that we're starting to start to focus on within the GI system. So taking that to the next level then, you get into this concept of gut ge uh, biogeography. And again, this is lifted from the human literature, but it's something worth paying attention to because you'll notice here on the slide that many of these phyla are phyla that we actually were um, speaking about in the previous cladograms and similar with these with these families. So bacteroidetes, bacteroidetes, uh, firmicutes, proteobacteria, as you get into the families, this Rickenellaceae, um, Ruminococcaceae, uh, and then you know over here into the level of the tissue, the fold regions, the digesta, we start really seeing that in fact, there is this whole biogeography to the bacterial microbiota. And so the focal points now seem to be getting beyond just replacement of, again, individual bacteria and really starting to think through how do we resolve this dysbiosis across the spectrum of not just the bacteria uh, as a whole, but also where they reside. You know, understanding that things like calf scours and the viruses eroding the mucosa are ultimately taking away part of that geography that's required for supporting certain of these bacterial species. So understanding that helps us understanding that ecology at the larger level, which should help us understand a little bit more about how to reset the, the balance. And, you know, ultimately what we're talking about then are these things like diet, antimicrobials, mucus and adherence, and the host immune system all playing together to help regulate that system as a whole. So that takes us into this final sort of concept of communities as, as restoratives. And where the, this whole realm is headed then is focusing on healthy microbiomes, having a community structure, and understanding that while each animal has one, um, that it's quite likely that in most cases, or at least many cases, those individual animal complexities make their healthy microbiome different from the next. But we know that there are groups of functional players. There's built-in redundancy. And, you know, at the end of the day, a healthy gut is durable and robust, but it's always under siege. And so when those, when those um, levels of robustness break down, we end up with dysbiosis, which means that the structure has been successfully disrupted. And that goes across the, the functions of commu community members and ultimately impacts that biogeography. And ultimately means that all those levels of communication among host and gut and within the gut and within the microbes within that gut itself uh, may be offline. And so that's what dysbiosis is getting at. And, you know, I think everybody is trying to get a, a better understanding of how do, you, how do you reset those community members back to a healthy level so that we have those healthy microbiomes, given the fact that there are individual differences and that it's not just one standard set. So I'll just sort of sort of set the stage for what will hopefully be the, well, not what hopefully, what will be the next um, level of analysis, what is what we're currently working on then we'll ultimately have to present in the coming months, which is the results from this phase two of the field trial, which was focused on FMT administration, focused on microbiota and gene expression. So using the data that I just presented to discriminate between healthy and disease and getting a better understanding then of how can we be comfortable that the calves are healthy, we were able to enroll in a second part of this project, 718 calves. Um, we ultimately then were able to uh, put some of those calves uh, with treatment with the FMT product and some without. We have samples from 504 healthy calves, 115 bright sick calves, 35 depressed sick calves, of which 162 calves received FMT broken across species. And we are currently going through the analysis of how the FMT impacted the microbiota, and then how the FMT also impacted uh, gene expression at that epithelial level. And um, probably as importantly, we are, uh, have enough data to be able to really get more nuanced in terms of the bright sick, depressed sick outcomes without 
FMT as part of the inputs. And so we're really focused on not just trying to understand if uh, fecal microbi microbiota transplant can help offset the, the effects of disease or prevent the effects of GI disease, but actually just really have a better understanding of what is going on in the calf as it goes through the sequence of, of uh, clinical disease states. So, you know, bright sick calves versus depressed sick calves, we hope we'll have some answers in terms of what they're really telling us about their, um, their changes within the gut itself at the gene expression level, but also certainly within the microbiota. Just to um, give a little bit more background in terms of what that looks like then, we, from the previous data that I just presented in that phase one, had this level of breakdown once you put the FMT into the mix, looking at those number of microbial species. So the FMT product that we created was a mix of healthy calves across ages. And as you can see, we ended up with a really diverse product, which we were hoping would, would get back to this concept of trying to reset the overall community balance as opposed to just focusing on sort of individual species or families. So uh, again, we're working on, through the data, trying to figure out what this actually did relative to the microbiota and the other clinical outcomes. And we'll hopefully have that in the nearest future um, so that we can talk about the impact of, on the gastrointestinal disease of the FMT, using it, as I said, as prevention versus therapy. And then um, I just want to point out that as part of this larger discussion, uh, you know, therapies are, are obviously at the front of everybody's mind in terms of what the possibilities are. And ancillary therapies for calf GI disease have been looked at. And um, one of the places that some of the data has been collated, collated is on our vet extension calf science site. So just wanted to point that out that, you know, while we've been focused on the FMT and some of these other diagnostics, there is just basic background information in terms of other therapeutic products that you can access through our vet extension site. Uh, ultimately, this phase two then will talk about the fecal microbiota response, and then, like I said, the gene expression. And then we were able to also do a little bit uh, more work on the bifidobacteria. And across both phase one and phase two, we have data that we're just getting now on IL-6 response as well on these calves. And then, like I said, we this summer will be finalizing our postmortem video and image library, and we'll have a, uh, eventually a bilingual hard copy protocol and image binders put together as well as part of this outcome so that we can kind of help people who want to get involved with doing more postmortem work on farms to help with some of the therapeutic outcome assessments as well as just clinical diagnostics um, and get other people involved on farm to help out with that. So I will wrap that up with or I'll wrap it up with that and just once again uh, throw out an acknowledgement to all of the folks that have helped support this work. I, uh, I think the I'll just leave it on the Leave, the, leave this presentation on the note that, um, you know, keep in mind, this is preliminary. The numbers weren't huge, but I think it starts telling a story about some of the impacts. And again, I think the three real take-home messages here are related to the fact that if you do postmortems, you might find some interesting things. It's worth pursuing, and it certainly can help with some of the therapeutic outcomes. Secondly, it really does seem as if getting people involved in um, doing a more nuanced job of diagnostics and clinical di clinical oversight, breaking down disease beyond just some of the symptoms and looking across the animal as a whole can uh, be quite helpful and can really help clarify why and when you are doing some of the therapeutics that you're doing. And then finally, I just want to point out that I think any one of us can get involved at a level of research that can really help start understand some of the outcomes across farms. And I think we all need to keep that in the back of our mind that, that we can be clinical researchers uh, in almost any setting. So thanks for listening. Um, feel free to contact us here at WSU, me specifically, if you have any questions related to this, and hopefully we will see you all soon. Thanks.